theory presents the probably the umbrella of the work that we are doing. Most of the projects are looking from a geotechnical perspective, what means we are looking at how the sediments behave as a bulk material and mechanically behave at different coastal uh, sediments and coastal processes, and in particular, when geomorphodynamics are active. So I chose this uh, title slide here. This is actually an image from a spit in the Arctic before sea on Herschel Island, and it displays so many issues that, that uh, represents a motivation for our work. You clearly see how there's these, these pools, these tidal pools here, that there's a lot of flooding going on. You can imagine, even though we are not seeing it here actively, but you can imagine how dynamic this spit is. And then also, that we have here interaction with the build environment. In this case, the site is actually has applied for UNESCO heritage site. It's an old whaling cabin from hundreds of years ago in, in Canada, and um, everyone would like to preserve it. However, you can see as shallow as it gets, and then with climate change, in particular in these Arctic regions, there's a lot of coastal processes coming here to work that are affecting the sediments here. So I will um, start with a brief motivation why we are doing the things we are doing, and then I will talk about geotechnical engineering as part of coastal science and engineering, how I view it. And one big part of that that we are specifically working on is instrument and method development, because there's actually fairly little geotechnical methods that are built for the coastal environment. There's more offshore geotechnical engineering, there's terrestrial geotechnical engineering, but in between there's a bit of a lack of methods. And then I will present some examples where we are working on geotechnical properties and relating them to coastal geomorphodynamics, and I will finish up with some concluding remarks. So some motivation, I'm sure I don't really have to give these uh, examples in detail to this audience, but just uh, as a reminder, so I already talked about Herschel Island down here, but then many of you guys are also familiar with the field research facility of the Army Corps of Engineers in Duck, North Carolina. And here again, you see you have this well-developed scarp in front of the dunes. So we are interested in how geotechnical properties affect erodibility, and on the other hand, how coastal morphodynamics and erosion and deposition processes are affecting geotechnical properties. Here on the right top side, I have two examples from Yakutat that's in southeast Alaska, and you see how significant here the erosion is. The beach is really thin, and here you have this cobble depth that is practically right in front of the slope to the hinterland, but you can also see how trees are literally breaking into the ocean here, and these are really calm conditions, no flooding at all. This is with a little bit backing up the same side and you see how how the beach thinens approaching here the cape you see the scar being developed here so very active processes this is obviously even more extreme if you think about extreme conditions i think um, that we had plenty of those this year with hurricane after hurricane but here an example from hurricane sandy where here the USGS actually collected cross-shore profiles in different locations along Fire Island. Again, you see how developed the island is here. And down here you have the profiles in, in blue or green pre previous early before the, the hurricane. And then you see these significant changes of erosion and sediment dislocation after the storm. We're also interested in that regard to scour being a more sp specialized or specific type of also geomorphodynamics, meaning erosion around different structures. So I brought in here different examples. So here on the top, this is a rubble mound seawall in Surfside, Texas. We visited this after Hurricane Harvey in 2017 in the framework of a reconnaissance mission of the geotechnical extreme event reconnaissance. And you see almost this perfectly textbook developed scour runner. So you may not be too concerned about this because it's only about 30 centimeters deep. So not, not a big deal really. However, we also saw that where this very narrow um, and thin channel approached the seawall, we had dislocation of boulders, what did not lead to a failure of the seawall, but clearly to destabilization. Here on the bottom, 
uh, measured after or visited after Hurricane Irma, also in 2017, we saw that the, the sediments around a beach house here in Sombrero Key in Florida eroded completely, scoured out completely, that led to the slab being exposed and actually the structure having some structural damage. And then a very different example of scour. This is a side scan sonar image of a tripod wind energy converter foundation. So you have a big windmill here on top. This is in the in the north, and you can see very strongly developed scour here. So there's actually a, a hole that is multiple meters deep. Then you have some sediment accumulation on this side, but obviously this represents a hazard to the foundations of this wind energy converter. Some other things we are working on actively are naval applications, and there's quite a variety of them. So one thing that we're working on very extensively is trafficability. So the question of certain vehicles can move over the beach without getting stuck. I chose here this image from this newspaper in Australia because I thought it was really funny that they were referring to a beach that eats cars. So cars get stuck here very often, and we're trying to predict why that is and be able to also assess that from remote sensing. Then there's interest for naval applications to relate geotechnical properties better to geoacoustic properties. This is a chirp sonar image from a lake here close by to our location here in the mountains. We work actively on on munitions in underwater environments for the site characterization, so for detection as well as uh, making recommendations how to mitigate as well as classification assisting um, with geotechnical properties for risk assessment. And then another aspect really important, we know that benthic biogenic processes such as tube worms or here it's actually clams and this is an x-ray of a sediment core from Chesapeake Bay with some clams and you can see the channels here. And we know that these guys are affecting geotechnical properties and by doing so also geoacoustic properties, what can confuse sonars. So that's another thing that we are interested in. So after this overview of motivation, I just want to like give a broader perspective how geotechnical engineering fits into coastal science and engineering. I think that has not been really um, much addressed uh, like decades ago, but certainly has gained really much more attention, I would say probably since the end 90s and early 2000s. Let's hear this example. This is a, a one of the definition graphs and, and uh, introduction graphs of the Nearshore Extreme Events Reconnaissance Association. I encourage you to visit their website as well, um, where they're trying to interdisciplinarily look into reconnaissance missions after extreme events in the coastal environments. And here actually we have listed geomechanics or geotechnical properties as one key um, information that is needed during these reconnaissance missions and learning what happens to coastal environments after extreme events. And if we are thinking about like a coastal environment like the one here, um, I just talked about erosion processes a lot, but then obviously foundation design and the build environment is becoming quite important, but then also marshes, lagoons, and so on. And also the, the American Shoreline and Beach Protection Association published actually a white paper on the future of nearshore processes research. And there, well, in this, in this uh, like little paragraph, it's not highlighted. However, sediment transport processes and understanding them better um, has been highlighted there. So how do we fit in here into the cycle that we have hydrodynamics, moving sediments, sediments if they're coarse or smooth or have different properties affecting potentially hydrodynamics and of course we have morphology that affects the hydrodynamics is also connected to the sediments but then it's also changing so very dynamic system so the geotechnical engineering is of course on the end of the sediments and as i said before differently than just looking at median grain size and more particle properties we are really looking more into um, how does the sediment behave under different loads and what do pore pressures do within the between the particles um, as well as like shearing um, like properties like friction angles. So to give you one example how these problems we are, we are interested in are looking like, this is a graph um, that I like to show for this very simplified but still hopefully gets the message across. So if you have an immobile bed with a, with a water column just over it, then obviously your seabed 
or your beach has certain properties of median grain size, bulk density, shear strength, friction angles, and uh, pr pore pressures. However, as soon as you switch on waves or currents to just hydrodynamic forcing, you may have sediment transport being initi initiated, what also depends on the soil properties. You may transport as bad load or suspended load. You may create actually bad forms. And we know that the sediment properties are affecting sediment transport, but then we also know how that sediment transport affects sediment properties. And so we have the circle here, and we are trying to understand better how these properties are changing in here. More interestingly, even if we are thinking about extreme events or sea level rise, if we are now inundated sediments that have not been exposed to sediment transport processes before, but we are currently just applying the same models, are we actually treating that right? Or are we missing something here? Because sediments in the nearshore zone are clearly adjusting to the stresses and the erosion processes that they're exposed to. But now if we, we are in sediments that have never been exposed to this are uh, affected by this, are they potentially even more erodible? Some other things that should need to be considered is habitats. Here just a few examples. This is a side scan sonar where we're looking at sand in between oyster reefs. Again, this is the, the clam sediment core, and we clearly see how these tunnels are form weakening the sediments. But also maybe like, like bigger fauna, like these horses walking at the beach, uh, having impacts their anthropogenic processes. Obviously, we are changing our environment quite a bit. And then again, this example of a built environment where all of this is a little bit included together. So if we are interested in measuring geotechnical properties um, of coast environments, then as I mentioned earlier, we are running into this issue of that there is actually not really good methods for it, that we are, have really well developed terrestrial and offshore geotechnical measurements, but not really anything uh, well developed in energetic nearshore environments. And so that leads to a number of challenges and issues. And it starts with simple things that onshore instrument may not be suitable for water and even more so not to salt water. That instruments may need a stable deployment platform. They are not sensitive enough to the loose or freshly deposited sediments, uh, measuring procedures take too long, devices are represent an environmental hazard, for example, for habitats or maybe for, for surfers, and then um, many more. So, so there is a little bit of a need to actually come up with new instrumentations. So my research group is really a field uh, method research group. So um, if we are looking at that, we are, we are looking into in situ and Physical testing on site, we're looking at sediment sampling and extraction for subsequent laboratory testing, and we're looking at remote sensing, and I will talk about these methods a little bit more. However, more importantly, we are interested in getting a number of different properties and, um, and, uh, and relationships here. And so I listed just few of the most important ones. So we are interested in particle and textual properties, right? So that is not only the grain size distributions, but also particle shapes and shape distributions, mineralogy, particle density, but also bulk density, porosity, relative density. Void ratio, so how much voids do you have over the particle? And then also looking into, into how, how much moisture content, gas content, saturation do you have? Strength-related properties like friction angles, cohesion, or for example, at the beach where you have partial saturation, apparent cohesion. So that means the particles are sticking more together just by the fact that they are not fully saturated, but they're moist. So that's kind of the sandcastle example. If you want to build a sandcastle and you want to build really nice towers at the beach, then you would always use moist sand and not just like perfectly dry or completely saturated sand. And then also pore pressure. So that's the pressure between your particles in the little voids that are filled with water that are not always as hydrostatic as we sometimes assume they are. So if we're looking into in situ testing. So the classic offshore method is comb penetration testing. And here are just two examples of comb penetrometer. And you immediately see these are pretty massive devices. It will not be very easy to deploy that in the near shore zone, shallow waters where you can only go with small platforms and vessels. While they work really well deeper offshore, where you don't have really waves, you also don't want this really hanging on a winch while the waves are rocking the boat. 
Then another um, uh, penetrometer type are free fall penetrometers. And here on this slide, you see the more traditional versions where you again like are penetrating the soil. So you're pushing practically a cone into the soil and you're measuring the resistance. So differently than the previous devices that I showed, you here don't have a big reaction frame that you actively push, but you're using the weight and your free fall momentum to practically insert this probe into the seabed. However, if you're thinking about energetic nearshore environments, you can easily imagine how these more heavy heads are being tilted over. And that's where smaller so-called portable freefall penetrometers come in. They actually exist in all kinds of different chain shapes from the sphere here to a more like um, torpedo style, fluid dynamically shaped over again, like more of the rod with the cone. And so all of these devices practically measure their resistance while they're impacting the seabed. And this gives us a measurement of strength. And, and there have been these devices like, like these guys that are very easy to deploy. However, they're also very differently shaped than our traditional geotechnical methods. So therefore we have to work more actively on, how, on figuring out how to process the data. At the beach, we are using different combinations of instruments. So again, we have here a free fall penetrometer that we let drop and it measures its own resistance or how hard the seabed is. Here we are using this on a, on a tidal flat. So it's fairly handy, you can just carry it, but it still has some weight. We also have using a new device um, that is uh, called a soil saber because it looks a little bit like the lightsaber handle. In that case, we are practically inserting it into the ground and we can use a vein. So we are, we are turning it and after the turning, we can measure how hard it is to move some blades to, through the sediment. And then we have also another type of push penetrometer. So all of these devices are practically measuring how hard the ground is and offering different options to deal with the water. So that then can look like this, and this is some data that one of my PhD students has produced. So imagine this is actually from Duck, North Carolina, where you have in this case the dune on the left side and the water line on the right side. You have on top here an estimate of relative density from samples that we collected, then moisture content collected with a little moisture probe, and then the resistance or strength measured with two versions of the soil saber, and then here, in this case, expressed as deceleration of a free fall penetrometer from different heights. So here, these bottom two practically both um, depict how stiff and strong and, and hard the sediment is. While here, we have the moisture contents, and this means how dense it is. And so the moisture content, I actually start here, is how we expect. Like from the dune, we are going through the intertidal zone, getting a little bit moister and moister, and then getting really wet here towards the water. And keep in mind, this is moisture content, not saturation. So at about this level, we are actually fully saturated. The relative density, interestingly, is fairly dense right on the toe of the dune, and this is right on the toe, something that we want to investigate more and don't really understand well yet. And then it is actually looser throughout the intertidal zone, then getting denser again and really dense in the swash zone, what is something that actually, for example, Dean and Dalrymple in the textbook on coastal processes already pointed out with one single sentence, but actually did not really have much data to present with. So and then if we're looking into these strength measurements down here, very interesting. So similarly, we see first a similar trend as the density, what is expected. So we have a little bit harder here, then it gets softer and a little bit harder together with the increase of density as well as moisture content. But then we see a big difference between these devices at the end where we have full saturation. And that is actually related to the instruments and how quick they are shearing. So that means if we are having this free fall penetrometer, we actually get increased strength from the undrained shearing and the full saturation, while here it feels softer because we are shearing much slower. So that means it just highlights that we have to understand better how our methods are actually collecting data to me make meaningful results for interpretation. 
So another thing of is continuous pore pressure testing. So I mentioned pore pressures again. So if you would be under a still water column, you would expect to just measure um, practically your hydrostatic pressure. But under waves, this is getting much more complex. So what we are doing is we are actually using these RBR wave gauges that you may know, and we, we apply them in as pore pressure sensor by burying them. So we're practically using them for a different purpose, and we arrange them usually vertically on different poles. And here's again, again examples where we're putting them in at Duck, North Carolina. And then we are trying to actually correlate it to flow velocity measurements using, in this case, an ADV. So the data looks like this. So this is, you see that this is actually quite different than what you may expect. Obviously, we are in the near shore zone, so the waves are much more irregular. This is also a short period here that we are looking at. And you're looking here at the pressure head of two sensors that are vertically arranged, as well as the ADV. So one thing first is that clearly the ADV measurements are related to the waves we are seeing, but not very intuitively uh, directly correlated. So it's actually much more complex what we are seeing in the water velocity versus just the, the pressure head differences. However, I also want to point out what we are mostly interested in is these differences between these two sensors. So what we are seeing is actually that we are getting somewhat of a, um, attenuation um, with depth, what is expected, as well as a little bit of a phase shift. And this little phase shift actually creates moments like this one or this one, where suddenly the lower sensor is seeing practically more pressure than the upper sensor. And if you think about like pressure heads, that means that suddenly you have flow starting practically upward and destabilizing potentially the sediment. We also collect sediment samples, as I mentioned before, for later testing. And we're using quite a variety of different instruments. We're using our gravity core here, as well as grab samplers. And then we also try to collect very well high quality like duck out and preserve cores that are usually a little bit shorter. Then remote sensing I mentioned as another method that we are very uh, interested in. So in this case, um, looking at sonars underwater, we're using single beam sonar or scour monitors. So this is an example collected with a scour monitor that has practically four beams. This is during Tropical Storm Melissa last year at the pier of the FRF. And what you're looking at is actually just a change in bathymetry. And interestingly, immediately when the tropical storm hit, we have this development of the seabed, oops, the seabed decreasing in height. So it means the scour hole evolves as we would expect during the storm. However, as soon as the storm is over, we immediately have infill, and this is very puzzling to us. So we're trying to investigate here more what's going on. We're also using side scan as well as chirp sonar to try to relate, as I mentioned before, more in detail how different geotechnical properties are related to geoacoustic properties um, for these different frequencies. But we're also using other remote sensing, in particular in the intertidal zone, we're using URV-based or satellite-based data. And so we're using RGB data as well as infrared um, images. And we are doing things like this. So this is uh, collected from a drone where we created these mounds or just these footsteps. We are practically reconstructing our, our point cloud. And then from our point cloud, we can slice it and we can look at certain angles here of the topography and we can relate that to angle of repose and we can relate that to friction angle. So we are trying to really in detail figure out how these small scale or larger scale topographic changes are related to these geotechnical properties. We're also looking at multispectral images. In this case, we have additionally to RG and B, the near infrared band, and my student Julie Pabrocki is working actively on this, trying to lay moisture contents of the beach to these images. So here you have two examples, one from Duck, North Carolina, one from Yakutat in Alaska. And if we are looking at this, I think we can all agree that we are seeing, okay, this is drier and this is wetter, but can we actually really uh, quantify this? And this is what Julie is working on 
um, getting practically the reflectance of each pixel in these images and relating that to measurements of moisture content. This is following examples that agriculture has actually applied before, but it has not been demonstrated at the beach. But now with satellite images, these images you're seeing here have a resolution of half a meter or better that allows us really to, to correlate it very well. We're also looking at synthetic aperture radar data. This is an example from New Hampshire in a mudflat. And you can see very nicely, this is practically the tidal channel. And then you have here the exposed mudflats. And you see very nicely how different moisture contents are being depicted in this mudflat in our SAR data. Also, Julie is working on this actively because an advantage of the SAR over the optic satellite images is that we can shoot this at night or during clouds and we're not so affected by weather. OK, if we're collecting this data, what are we doing with this? So this is an example that actually uh, I collected during my PhD time, so it's quite old. However, I'm still uh, really happy and uh, proud about it because it was one of our first real encounters where we, where we felt we are connecting geotechnical measurements with active geomorphodynamics. And so we're looking at the Danish Knutedip tidal channel. You have these beautiful dunes here. This is actually a multi-beam image collected over the dunes, you see the crests here, and then you see this actually in the in the 2D profile, very nice, these elongated app-dominated dunes with some secondary dunes on top here. So we did measurements here throughout the tidal cycle with multi-beam as well as penetrometer measurements. And in the penetrometer measurements, if you think about the x-axis representing strength or how hard it is, and here reflected as what we call a quasi-static bearing capacity, or also just more simplified as the deceleration of the device when it impacts it. And you see it's very shallow penetration, just 25 centimeters. However, and this is an older device, so our resolution is not that great, but we could clearly see that there was a really weak layer on top of about six centimeters strength before it got harder. And so this was really interesting because been looking for how the mobile layer, so the sediment that is actively involved in sediment transport, how thick is this layer and how weak and loose is that actually over the st stable substratum. And this was one of the measurements the first time we were able to really depict that. So what we did then is we took this thickness over time throughout the tidal cycle and we looked at how this thickness is changing. And sure enough, there's quite a bit of scatter, as you can imagine, if you drop in different locations along these, uh, these, uh, these dunes. However, by trend, we would see that this, this top layer, this mobile, really weak layer, when it got really thin during max aptide, and then thickened towards slack, and then thinned again, but not as much as before during max flood tide. So this was the first time that we were able to actually see how this loose layer is changing really in thickness over time during these processes. We also related that, and not shortly after, still work out of my PhD to, to scour, and this is again like this, uh, this tripod wind energy converter, and what we did here is we practically did penetrometer measurements between the legs of two of the tripod legs here. And what we looked at here on the black curve is practically the strength prior to construction. So before they build the wind energy converter, then during the construction or very shortly after, and then uh, another half a year later. And what we would see is that we had quite the stiff seabed before, but then after construction with actually continuing scour, we would see that the surface was actually softening up. Again, not very thick, but it clearly showed how this was related to this. Then later on, one of my PhD students did some more work at the Outer Banks, and we, he looked into if he can actually relate our strength measurements to current wave conditions. With the idea of and not only wave condition, but also water depth. So with the idea of can we actually express how soft and how thick this layer is for different wave conditions and water depths at a certain at a certain location with certain sediments. So what we have been looking at here is practically the same data that I showed you before. So it's practically the penetration depth or thickness of these layers here at Z, and then how much resistance we actually measured during these uh, examples. And then we related this to water depth and we related this to um, 
to the uh, deep water wavelength. And what came out, and this was very experimental in the, in the first attempt, was quite interesting that we, in this factor, we could clearly distinguish a shallow zone, uh, an intermediate zone, and a deep zone where we had much less change what meant that here we have very little uh, waves actually affecting the seabed from a geotechnical perspective and that increasing to the shallow zone. While I agree this is intuitive and this is kind of what you expect, however, we never had this really in numbers related to the geotech properties. And then this actually represented then going to a storm event and we could also look at the changes here. Uh, I don't really have time to go too much into detail here, but if you're interested, please check out Ali's um, publication. I'm also happy to send it to you. Also related to Scour, this is work one of my current PhD students is working on, and he measured Scour holes in inundated areas, so not offshore areas, after Hurricane Michael in 2018. So they went to all of these buildings, they observed these Scour holes, and they measured how thick they are. And then Matthew looked into what would be predicted scour. And I understand that this plot is a little bit like um, hard to understand if you see it the first time. But imagine practically the, the, the y axis represents what was measured. And then this is the whole range of different predictions you can come out with depending on what parameters you choose and what kind of methods you're using. And then you have the one to one line here. So what that tells you is that actually in most cases, the scour was deeper than what was predicted, what should not be the case because these are conservative methods. So it should actually be the other way around. All predictions should be on, oops, should be on this side of the, of the curve. And so we were asking the question, why, why is it that we, we under predict scour, even though we use these very safe and conservative um, equations, why are we in, under predicting in these inundated areas? And one hypothesis was that we are actually experiencing liquefaction from wave forcing. So liquefaction would mean that your sediment goes suddenly into suspension from pore pressures from what I mentioned earlier, that you have these flip and head gradients, you suddenly increase flow upwards, and that is leading then to, um, to practically putting your sediment into suspension. And we did some lab measurements and compared that to some pressure recordings, and indeed we found that there's very brief, but there are moments where we indeed have such pressures that could do this. What we don't really understand yet is, is this time enough or are we just like looking at two short events? Is this our explanation for our observations here? So this is another aspect where geotechnical measurements really become important for understanding the scour here. Okay, I, I've talked a lot and, and, and very fast, so I just want to wrap up with some concluding remarks. Um, so one of the key things I hope that came through is that coastal marine geotechnical engineering is actually increasing in importance and that there's a number of research problems and, and projects in practice as well that cover a wide range of issues and topics where geotechnical engineering could make a contribution or help out. Then the key part when we are doing geotechnical engineering in coastal marine environments is really we understand ourselves as a partner in inter and multidisciplinary collaborations. You saw while I presented a lot of mostly the data we are working on, I hope you notice that there were often other measurements and other uh, like, for example, the ADV measurements. So we are working with collaborators from coastal engineering, from oceanography, from something uh, sometimes uh, bio, uh, biology and ecology to actually understand the bigger picture. So we're really seeing ourselves and hopefully bringing a small part to this and a small new perspective instead of offering new solutions. However, there is clearly a need for um, novel and improved instruments and methods. So that's another thing where sometimes people are asking me if I could deliver this property and can do this measurement. But sometimes we're just running into the issue that we don't have the right instrument to me measure this. And we actually have to think about how we can do this and adjust our measurements accordingly. But we are always interested in collaborating and uh, trying to find solutions um, if such measurements are desired and we can help out with that. 
That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I have to acknowledge here not only all these collaborators that I'm very uh, happy and grateful to collaborate with on a daily basis, but then also my students, because most of the data that I presented to you today have been collected by my students and they are um, with me or sometimes also without me in the field and also really doing the analysis and we're working as a, as a big team here so I have to send credits to them as well instead of just uh, me presenting the results. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm very happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, Thank you, for, Nina such, for such a nice, such a nice presentation. presentation. Uh, uh, we have a couple of questions, so, so anyone, anyone without... without... ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? pregunta? Ah, ah, creo que... ¿Cristian? Sí. <laughs> Hi, Nina. Hi, Cristian. Good to see you. <laughs> I'm here. I... When you talk about uh, the technical characteristics in the coastal zone, the first thing that comes to my mind is not coastal processes, but ports. So, because they are the big builders in the coastal zone, right? right? So I'm wondering what's in the work you're doing. I will guess there's a lot of common ground with port engineering. How's your experience with with the people working in ports? Do you have yeah. communication with them and collaborations or yeah. yeah, so so a lot of my so so some of my colleagues uh, from geotechnical engineering are actually very involved in foundation design of port as well as loading of, for example, reclaimed land, right? or of heavy cranes go right there. So in, in my research group, because we are usually more focusing on more shallow problems, we are mostly aligned with port engineering when it comes to dredging interaction. So we have multiple port projects where we, for, for example, trying to find a better understanding how different dredging actions is actually changing the sediments and how can you potentially find solution that you don't have so much sedimentation or consolidation so maybe you don't have to dredge that often but also the assessment right when do you in particular in places that are dealing with fluid mud or very very poorly under consolidated sediments so that they are not consolidating very quickly so that's often places where you would have a port and you have a flood and suddenly you have a big sedimentation event you have a lot of sediment that is coming in at the same time and because it's so much the consolidation is actually really slow and so then you you keep this very soft material and very often that's almost more problematic than if it would consolidate and actually then thinen down much more right so that is something where we are working uh, quite actively and have worked in different ports actually across the world and doing measurements often with a small penetrometer that I showed because it's very handy and we have given it actually to uh, for example the harbor master at two places the harbor master just took it out and could do measurements every day and could actually measure like the strength of the seabed and how deep these soft layers are extending like one study we did for example was in New Zealand in the port of Taranga where we looked at different docking sites and where the sedimentation was occurring and then looking into their dredging actions okay we have an interesting coast here because it's very very flat you know right and we have very small ports so it's not really well it's, it's actually fishing harbors you know yeah and shelter areas for the fishing boats and i think we don't have a very good understanding of the coastal processes there so it will be right. interesting to work with you yeah. when we get the chance <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah okay thanks thank you thank you alguien tiene otra pregunta In the meantime, I have one or two questions. Sure. One, one is uh, if you have uh, measured these uh, geotechnical properties in the surf or swash zone in uh, intra-wave uh, scale, like, I mean, to for example, during a swash event to know how this uh, relative density changes and or other other properties. That's one, and the other is. 
if there is any better option for for computing sediment transport in the near shore because most of them relies on d50 or uh, de sediment density is, right. is I mean, is there any way we can use all this knowledge to improve those formulations or or is anyone already proposed? I, I don't know if you can comment on that. Oh yeah, really great question. So I start with the first one. So we are really interested in, in different scales on time and space. So as well as wave heights, right? So we are trying and that's where where actually like research facilities like yours, as well as like, for example, the facility in Duck are really great because there's already the infrastructure there that we can actually do monitoring at different scales without having to put a lot of infrastructure into places. And so we are trying, for example, um, like a study we did that um, I showed like from my PhD student Ali Albatal that included actually measurements throughout Hurricane Matthew. So we actually had someone during Hurricane Matthew go out on the pier there and was able to do that safely and did actually measurements throughout that. And the same with these pore pressure measurements where we actually left the sensors in throughout Tropical Storm Melissa, which is all possible if you have more local infrastructure compared to if we are just going to a to a new beach, right, where that no one has really measured before. And then we are really looking at trying to get different conditions from the waves as well as currents, but also really looking at uh, different tidal stages, right, where we are here on, on, if we're on an ebb tide or if we're uh, low water or high water, as well as looking at really in the swash different time scales. So we, we have done like experiments where we practically just staying in one place and we're trying to drop through different phases of the swash zone. And what we've done usually is that we actually video it so that we have an optic uh, like proof that we know when the drop actually happens, right? How, how far the swash is. So it's really, um, it's really like we are interested in all of that because we are still so data poor. Actually, we still have so little data right from so few locations that we are um, practically really trying that again and again in different places and and different sediments are also really becoming important there. Right. Like, for example, where you guys are is very different than the sediment, the sands that we are usually dealing with. Right. So we would expect that the response is quite different. And then on your second question, so that is a really, really great question because it's really one of the key motivators that drives a lot of our work. So there have been models that have proposed, for example, using also bulk density of the material and also including uh, friction angles instead of a particle uh, grain size distribution, go directly to a friction angle that is practically including effects from the shape as well as particle sizes, right? And implementing this, there have been also single studies where people propose to, for example, adjust the shields parameter based on pore pressures. However, one key, and that's again where the where the instruments come in, is really that we that again we are too data poor yet to really implement it very confidently, right? And we are really hoping to contribute a little to that by bringing more data and more reliability in the methods. That's why on, on our end, I feel methods development is really important, as well as really the data collection in, in different places with different conditions, so that what is currently more theory than practice, for example, I've, I've talked to one investigator who proposed to include friction angles, but then I asked the, the investigator what friction, what friction angle he chooses, and he said he just chooses 32 for every sand, but he said that's because he doesn't know any better number right now, right? And so there I think we see really a great potential if we could improve really that we can provide really good numbers. And even if we could provide one number but a standard deviation with it or, or just like changes a little bit depending on the sand, that could improve quite significantly. And, and the changes in the models would actually be fairly fairly easy. For example, we're also talking to, to investigators like Ryan Mulligan, for example, right? What would be pathways to implement this into a model? What would be the most convenient to actually move this along? So I think that's a really great opportunity for the future for, for, for a lot of, there's a lot of space for people measuring these things and, and developing more methods and being creative of actually implementing this into, into erosion prediction and, and coastline evolution prediction. Thank you. Thanks, Alec. Preguntas? Uh, 
I don't see any hand rise. Ah, no, that's mine. Just, I mean, if, if there is no more questions, I have a last one. Okay. Well, the, the two, two. One, one is if you have worked with the, um, with the, the role of living organisms in the buried organisms, in the, uh, yeah, in the properties or in the, in the capacity of waves to, to move the transport. And the last one is just to, to give us a, an idea of this portable uh, instrument. Uh, I mean, if, in what stage is right now, if it's a, a commercial or not, or what, what's the way to, to, to get uh, access to, the, to this type of technology? So, so most of the instruments I showed are actually commercially available. Um, for example, this little freefall penetrometer is actually mostly commercially used in port engineering. So Christian's question was a really good fit. So, so there it is probably the most established because the measurements are more easy to translate, to put it that way. Um, but so that is commercially available and also the, the few others that I showed, most of them are actually commercially available. There's not too many out there in the world yet and uh, it's a kind of still small community. Um, and, and there's also a good number, I would say probably it's still 60% that they are with research groups and 40% in industry. So there's always a good opportunity through collaboration actually to, to get some first measurements, but they are commercially available. And then uh, we are, for example, very as well as a lot of the other research users, we are fairly open with sharing our data analysis codes with people because one thing is that compared to other instruments, I would say that probably the data analysis platform is still a lot of user dependence. So you get practically a software with a device that is very basic. Um, and so, so we are practically reprocessing everything in Python or MATLAB. But so most of the research users are actually really open with, we, we are, for example, sharing our codes. I know that there's an Australian group using them and they are openly sharing their codes. And so, so there, there is some availability there, probably needs some reaching out to people, but the community is small and very co collaborative, I would say. And then um, uh, to go back, can you remind me of your first question? Sorry, talk too long about yeah. your second question. Yeah, about uh, living living organisms in the yes or yeah if they if, if they play a role or not. Oh yeah, absolutely, and we are actually just getting into it. So there is uh, the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. actually just funded I think three or four years ago um, a full research center and program on bio geotech interaction. However, most of the of the PIs there are very focused on terrestrial processes and not so much yet an offshore and if so, really more further offshore for oil and gas industry and very little at the coastal zone. However, there is a lot of interaction. So, for example, at, when we work at DUC, there's really millions of these ghost crabs and they all dig holes. And we can see in our pore pressure measurements that if they dig a hole really close to our our sensor that the sensor actually reads quite different results than if we would not have this crab hole there. So, um, so there's a lot of impact there. And we also know, and in, in again, like going back to ports, we did a study in, in the port of Sydney, not Sydney, Australia, actually Sydney, Nova Scotia, and they did a big dredging interaction there. But when we did the assessment of the seabed, there were a lot of tube worms. So actually when divers first investigated the seabed in the port, it felt very steep. But as soon as we cut with a penetrometer through this tube worm carpet, it was it was very loose and it was almost like all in suspension. So there's a lot of impact and we, we don't really understand it yet. And I think that's another really great direction of looking more into to understand what's going on there and to implement that again, like for erosion models, right? Thank you. So Thank you, if there is no more questions, uh, I will thank you for, for your presentation and we hope you have you here. <laughs> so.
I hope so too. I will. I really love to visit. I, I really look forward to it. And I hope as soon as this whole COVID situation hopefully calms down, that I have the chance to visit. And uh, I think my email address is on the slide. So if any questions come up later from anyone in the audience, please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about these things. Thank you very much. And Thank you. see you soon. Bye bye. bye, -bye.